so it should be working. So who are you? <laughs> who am I? Well, right now I'm an old guy. I passed 94 and a half. And I'm visiting my third son, Arthur, and his wife, and his server. That's it. There. They're wanting me to t tell some of my story about coming to Peace River. When we got to from Nipawa, Manitoba, uh, or from Ontario out to Manitoba and out to Peace River, out to Edmonton, uh, we headed for uh, Edson to head north, but the, uh, the road was not fit and the police wouldn't let anybody head north from Edson. We were, went out and worked at a camp out there and then my cousin got fired or deliberately got himself fired and we headed back to Edmonton and uh, we couldn't get a ride on the train back to Edmonton so we had to walk back as far as Edson and uh, came into Edmonton and we made it uh, uh, the attempt to go to Athabasca Landing. There was no railroad, the last part, and, and it was under construction, and so they wouldn't take any passengers. Some trouble with the conductors having scrounged the fare that was paid. So we walked. My cousin had trouble with a toe, was the one overlapping another. I had to stop and, and uh, chisel a toenail for him, broke my razor doing it. But we got up about uh, 18 miles from Athabasca Landing, a little bit closer, and there was a, a work train loading gravel for the ballast of the road, the last little stretch into Athabasca Landing. And we started out walking, and at last we, they, they caught up and, and allowed us to ride on the first uh, locomotive that crossed the bridge into Athabasca Landing. And then we had to wait there in Athabasca Landing for a while to, for the Northland Call, I think the name of it was. The they boat that sailed up uh, uh, as far as uh, Mirror Landing, Fort Smith now. And uh, then we had to do a, a portage to uh, come to the navigable part of the other little river that comes from, Ath from Lesser Slave Lake. And uh, we walked that 18 odd miles carrying our packs and caught the other steamboat and then come up to Gruard. And Gruard at that time was a very notable town, not, noted town, advertised very highly. They had a, were building a hotel there. They were using green lumber from the mill right there, but the mill was short of lumber and uh, short of logs to, to the saw, and uh, they come and offered us best wages I had 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 offered to go into the woods and, and cut logs, and, and uh, we did that for about a month and a half, and uh, we put the logs into the lake and made rafts of them, and they hauled them by steamer into Gruard and for the sawmill, and. Then my cousin, along with me, he hired or, or 
paid a deposit on a pack pony, and uh, on Labor Day we headed for Peace River on the old Gouard Road, Peace River Gouard. Uh, along the way, about halfway along, a team, a team dray wagon with a load of lumber passed us. It was the load that was to be used for the construction of the Canadian Bank of Commerce at Peace River. Well, we got along as far as Burnt River. And I didn't like to travel on Sunday, but the next day was Sunday, and my cousin was determined to go ahead because there was a buckboard caught up to us there and was going on and was going to be able to, to take part of our load and uh, we'd be able to, one of us ride horseback and the other ride in the back of the buckboard. <coughs> well, they, I was disturbed about going on Sunday. I was uh, very keen, uh, very uh, uh, positive that it wouldn't, it wasn't good. Anyway, they started off and went on four miles, not quite four miles, and there was a road turning to the left, southwestward, had a sign on it, Dunvegan, and that's where we were heading for, but it, it also advertised uh, green growth, uh, green stuff and eggs. And uh, the drivers figured it was some gimmick to try, uh, draw us off of the regular road, and the best road was straight on west. So they followed on, and I knew they were going the wrong direction, but they landed up at uh, Moss Lakes Reserve, and uh, the Indians cleared out as soon as they saw us coming. Anyway, we followed on after we had a... a stop for a lunch, just a brief lunch, and we followed on and we must have went 16 miles following them along, way out into the hay country. And then we caught up to the Indians again, and I had learned a few Indian words from having uh, shorthand and uh, had seen some of their words and had inquired what they meant and so on in, in the camp where we're working in, uh, alongside the lake. Uh, and I got up on the seat and, and called to these folks and asked them the road to Dunvegan. It's Miss Canood, or Dunvegan, Miss Canood, in w one word. And they came back, and uh, then when we spoke in their language, they came back, four, four of them, and told us we were, we had to go clear the way back to Moss Lakes Reserve and start south from there. Well, uh, we did that, but uh, we st stayed overnight in uh, Moss Lakes Reserve, went on to Dunvegan in the morning, and going down the hill in the morning, I wanted to get some change out so we could buy some stuff in the store, and I felt in my pocket and my wallet was gone, and I had lost all my wages and, and uh, over uh, over $80 besides. There was no way of finding it. The, the, the country behind us was burning. They, they had just, somebody had set fire to the prairie. Anyway, we went back. Uh, following the road, we went back to, to the Moss Lakes Reserve, and I found I had lost my jackknife there, too, when I was dressing out some prairie chickens. But uh, also, in the meantime, we had called down in, in the waterhole country, we'd called at the home of the newly arrived Methodist minister, and he, his wife and, and her sister were there. And good job we came there because some Indian women came there and, and 
they were evidently intending to be mean. They uh, they wanted some tobacco and matches, and, and they were speaking in in French or or Indian language. But I I was able to supply them some matches, but. Uh, we didn't have any tobacco, but I pacified them by <coughs> giving them half a dozen chickens that I had shot, prey chickens. I would shot them at 22. My cousin wouldn't uh, wouldn't pass it up when we'd see some prey chickens close. He wanted to shoot them. Well, we, we had a whole load of them on the pony. So uh, we went on back, and as far as as the Burnt River, Blue Sky, call, uh, uh, and later on called, and uh, Alec McAllister there persuaded Bill Chowan to file on a quarter and took him back to look it over. I was discouraged completely, uh, having lost my money. I wanted to get back out to Edmonton, and uh, if I could, but I. Without money, I couldn't go, but Bill, uh, my cousin, uh, insisted that he would pay my way out and we'd work it out there uh, for the winter and then get a team and come back in in the spring, which we did. But uh, when we got down as far as Gouard, he filed on that quarter and persuaded me to file on one north of him, but I never saw it all. Anyway... Um, that fall, I went straight away to the uh, in Edmonton to the YMCA, and uh, they got me a job out on the farm at uh, uh, Nameo, working for a Mr. Broomfield. And I worked out there for the fall, uh, thrashing, and, and uh, came back into Edmonton. I know uh, there's some story in the meantime about how come I, uh, well, anyway, the fall work was done, uh, or practically thrashing was done. But when I got into Edmonton, uh, they, they got me a job working for Swift Canadian in their uh, uh, in their uh, Freezer, de not freezer department in their, uh, 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 what do you call it? The uh, anyway, where they store their uh, stuff for the markets for the butcher shops. They had five teams on five routes that they delivered meat to the butchers in Edmonton, and we put up the orders for the, these butchers. And I being able to drive horses, they put me on also as helper with all these, with, with any driver that they had an extra load on until I knew every route in Edmonton and I had to be a relief. And, and uh, that I did, worked at that all winter. And they wanted me to take a job as an invoice clerk and I wouldn't because they were only paying $15 a month, the same wages as I was getting. And uh, so come springtime, I left them, and, and uh, uh, a man in North Edmonton helped me buy a team of horses. In fact, he bought them for me, and I bought a sleigh, and uh, Bill Chowan came back. Uh, it seems that a letter he sent to me was badly addressed, and the post office didn't hand it out to me. But he did arrive back in time. And we came to Peace River with our, uh, we had to ride, drive, of course, to Athabasca and then on the river ice up to Peace River. And at the head of the river, head, head of Peace River Hill, in a stopping place there, one of my horses apparently rolled in the stall and, and uh, in rolling he, he kicked the other horse with his sharp shoes, sharp shoes for the winter roads, and he, he, he the, my other horse lost the joint oil and was crippled. We got as far as Alley Brick's place, 
and uh, going up the hill from early bricks, I, I had to take and carry the neck yoke and lead the, one, the crippled horse behind and make the, uh, tie the one horse back to carry all the load. We didn't have such a, a terrible big load. Our load was, we had a, a, a good sleigh bottom and then sides on it and a tent on top of that and stove in it so we were able to cook our own meals and sleep in our tent. Well, we got home to Blue Sky, that far to Alec McQuarrister's place, and the, the crippled horse just lasted three days and he took locked jaw and had to be killed. How's that for enough? Well, that's pretty good. What year was that? 19... Uh, 12, 13, see, uh, 19, uh, 11, I was in the bank, 1912, we came to Peace, to Peace River the first trip, and it was in the spring of, eight, uh, of 13 that I went to Peace River. Okay, you told Davy a story about some rice, you better tell that story about, too, <laughs> about well, the rice. Well, that's, when we, before we went up the hill at Alley Bricks Place, Yes, I was cooking some rice as well as our other stuff for dinner and on the stove. And I had our utensil was a four pound jam pail and I'd put the rice and salt and raisins and water in it and somehow the lid got clamped on too tight and the pressure and it exploded and the rice went all over their kitchen and the other freighters there were kidding me and, and uh, Allie Brick's daughter Emma uh, <laughs> that I needed a cook <laughs> but I didn't have to, uh, she cleaned it up anyway I didn't have to feed up but that was kind of a <laughs> mess I made there that was uh, we had to go from there out to Griffin Creek and stopped overnight at Griffin Creek and got as far as as uh, Burnt River the, the next day. And uh, as I say, three days afterwards, my horse was killed. Um, then we only had one horse. It was a very good white horse, all white. And the Indians wanted their tail hair for <laughs> for their uh, sewing. I don't know whether Betsy <laughs> dipped some hair out and, and made the horse mad, but <laughs> she couldn't, didn't dare come near a face of him. <laughs> I don't know whether he, uh, whether this horse was, had a, a spite on all ladies or not, but uh, that was the only lady I saw uh, near, but I know it was, <laughs> He made it plain that she didn't dare come near him. <laughs> I had to trade that horse off to, to Mr. Morrison for, he traded it off later on, way on, and uh, later on in the summer for a team of oxen. And one of those oxen had been shot in the behind end. Uh, they said he was breaking into eating the potato shawls in somebody's garden. Anyway, he had lead poisoning. He died before Christmas. <laughs> but Mr. Morrison uh, relieved me of part of the price. I had to pay more than the horse for it. See, he relieved me of that cash difference. But uh, then uh, my neighbors, my McCorsters, had bought a team of oxen from the, in, in place of their Broncos. And being Indians, they, they couldn't uh, put up with driving oxen. They had started off to make a trip to, to uh, uh, Peace River and when the, the little hill starting away from the house, the rig ran up on the oxen's tail and, uh, and instead of them running, uh, they bought, uh, held back and George went back to his stable and got a pitchfork 
and he run them horses all the way to, Les to Old Wives Lake, and then I don't know how far he run them the rest of the way, but he broke the wind so that they were ruined as far as their lives was concerned. But I got one of them, one of that team, the best one of them. Bill Chowan bought the other one. The Indians uh, got rid of them. And uh, Bill Chowan, uh, his, his ox was bothering the cattle so bad that he put a pair of, of hobbles on it to stop it from doing that. It went down in the creek to get water and couldn't get out again and got wandered up the creek and was lost for about a week before we, we found him. And his legs were so badly swollen that Bill could, had a, an awful job to, to whittle the, the uh, hobbles off him. Never was any good, but I guess they made beef of uh, still in the fall time, some kind of beef. But my oxen, I, I had to buy another one. And I got uh, a very wonderful ox. Um, I called him Moose. He had, a, he had uh, one horn was was crippled down, and the other was crippled up and, uh, or turned up. And I used to hang my pail on his horn with my chains and whatnots in it, and ride him back into the bush to, to skid out my logs. Oh, wonderful ox it was. The other old ox that was windbroken, when he'd go to drink water, he would just take one little sip and he, he couldn't steady himself. He would give himself a hunch and <laughs> one time he upset, he would turn on somerset right over into the creek. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed at him and laughed at him. And, <laughs> and he objected to that and he tried to climb out the other side of the creek away from me, <laughs> and I had to coax him to come back. <laughs> That's a part of that deal. But the mosquitoes and the flies, for anybody or oxen, it was simply a torture. It was terrible, terrible, terrible. But I was plowing one day and, and uh, come within about 60 uh, yards or so from a little bit of a willow, and that team of horses, uh, of oxen, just broke away and, and they bolted through that bush and tore and tore the bush all to pieces, for, uh, slapping it around like a like a moose <laughs> to, uh, to flap the flies off themselves. There was, we didn't have any repellent, excepting the. Uh, pine tar, and we put pine tar and lard, but that would soon sweat off the animals, and, and uh, we didn't have fish oil, and uh, didn't know about fish oil anyway at that time, but uh, the, the mosquitoes, black flies, anywhere up in this country at that time, if you were wearing glasses, you'd go blind because they'd get behind your glasses and sweat your eye would swell up shut. A uh, neighbor, uh, one man working for us so along Lesser Slave Lake I got that. Well, incidentally, when walk, working along at, on, at that logging camp on the site of Lesser Slave Lake, uh, about 10 miles uh, east of Gouard, the uh, Blueberries and, and lowbush cranberries were growing on the sand uh, under the poplar trees on the first bar out from the lake. And uh, incidentally, uh, there was coal about six feet down. If you dig, dig a well to get water, it would get black with, with coal. Not only that, but some big chunks of coal would wash up on the lake shore. And boy, oh boy, were the fish ever plentiful in that lake. It was really a, 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 a godsend to us because at the camp there they had only what we called sow belly, sour, it's, it's salted uh, pork bellies. And uh, that was all the meat they had. And uh, when the company allowed us 
our foreman to take a little net and fish. One of the men, an Irishman, built a flat bottom boat with lumber, and we used, used to string that net. I forget how many yards of it was, uh, 25 yards or so of net out there, and they caught all the fish we could eat, beautiful white fish. And you could look down 18 feet in the water and see the fish. It was just beautiful. What was the, where was that? Uh, east of Gruard, along the north shore of Lake, let's just say. I was in that in that camp and I was working out there. We had one Indian lad with me. I had his name, but I've forgotten it right now. Anyway, I was on Sunday. I was walking back in the woods and I found a camp, a house back in there, Miskin House, log house. <laughs> Miskin was the name. Anyway, uh, in the yard I found a, a bow, an Indian bow, had a string to it and uh, some arrows and I brought them back to the camp and this Indian guy asked me where I got them and I told him and it was all right. There was, there was some clothes hanging on a tree out there too but uh, I, he says, I wonder if I could use that arrow, that bow. I said, and, uh, I said well, you can try and I let him try and, and uh, there was a, a tin can sitting there and uh, he lift, uh, strung the bow, and, and uh, I thought he just slipped and it, it hit the, his arrow, blunt-headed arrow, hit that can. And I, I laughed as well. Uh, that was an accident, but maybe you could try, and I'll bring the arrows back to you. And <laughs> he never missed it once. And he rolled that thin can down into the lake. <laughs> That's. Uh, I was going to name his name, but it just flipped out of my mind again. Uh, our, Alfie knew some people of that name up in there. Uh, anyway, he was just a young man, and they had a, at that camp we had a dugout canoe, a, 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 just a, a big, big black poplar log hollowed out, and that guy could stand up in there and, and paddle that canoe all around. Uh, ordinary person could hardly keep it sitting right side up and sitting down. <laughs> that was a, quite an experience there. Uh, that's a, this uh, man that built the canoe, built that, that, that little boat, built the little board boat that we used for fishing. Uh, I was going to name his name. He, he's, he was an Irishman had been president of the Irish uh, Linen, uh, Handmade Linen Society over in Ireland. He, he <laughs> I found that out because uh, on a Sunday I was sitting in the bunk and I saw some shorthand writing on, on the side of the wall. And I had mentioned it a couple of times and finally this man asked me, well, is it, if it's shorthand and, and you know shorthand, he says, what does it say? Uh, shorthand is, is phonic. It, it's, uh, it's by sound, not by spelling. So I, I made the sounds that these uh, symbols made. He told me that it was Indian words, and he told me what it was. That's how I come to learn a few Indian words. But he, he was... Uh, Secretary of a, a, a society uh, of see, linen. They started making it by same as uh, same as in Scotland. They started doing their knitting by, uh, by machinery. They started doing the same thing with linen and handmade linen was expensive and, and special. And he was secretary of that over in Scotland. But liquor was his trouble. I found out afterwards. <coughs> going to name his name. He had a, he had found a, a placer claim down in in, uh, in the part that's now the reserve uh, west of Edmonton. What's uh, uh, what's the name of the color? <laughs> Jasper, Jasper, Jasper. He had a, but they wouldn't let him file on him because 
it was in the reserve, but it, it was a good blaster like mine. Uh, if he had been allowed to, <laughs> to uh, panic, well, that's good enough, I guess. Well, you didn't tell me where your land was. Land? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, it's uh, when the bridge crossed the Burnt River, the only bridge that was uh, there at the time, it was at, uh, between Alec McAllister's and George McAllister's pro uh, property on the Burnt River, and uh, my homestead was uh, a mile a mile and a half north of that. Uh, of course, this place went half a mile, Bill Jones another half, and then mine was the next. And uh, there's a slough on that, and they still named Taylor Slough, I believe. And uh, I could mention that fact about uh, McCorrister told me that in the earlier days before that, he had been down at, at Shaftesbury, he had a property at Shaftesbury, sold it and got that up there and some machinery. Uh, he had had a, a debt of $125 with the Hudson Bay Company at Dunvegan, and his family went out and killed beaver and cleared that debt at 25 cents a hide in one week. Now, when I was there, there was only one beaver left in the in the whole area. That was right at the very mouth of Burnt River, uh, down again, where it went into the Peace River. I have my picture, in fact, down in a, standing up in a canoe down on that spot where the beaver is. But uh, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Gip, Mrs. Whitford tried to sell me a, a cap made with a beaver skin, but all but one little piece. She didn't have enough to make it. <laughs> And I had the money to buy it, $25 here. We had a beautiful calf. But that beaver uh, being so scarce in all our country was called, uh, it was, uh, beaver was our uh, Canada's emblem. And uh, later on, Manitoba, I was, in, I was, implicated in the, the starting of the trappers uh, registered, registered trap line system that went all over the world now, the trappers system. And Arthur tells me there's lots of beaver up here now again. Mm -hmm. But from, from from Winnipeg at that, when they started out that, uh, I was living at Victoria Beach a good part of the time. and. Uh, they came down and tried to get me to come in along with them in the managing of the of the trapper lines. They have a conference every year and uh, iron out any trouble between the trappers because they don't survey a trapper's tra claim. They have it described by rivers and hills and so on, lake shores. You said you started some school or something at Blue Sky? What's that? The school. Oh, I, I was secretary. They, since I was, I had been a bank clerk, and so I was, and I had my uh, business course in college. They got me as, as uh, secretary when we applied for the first other school besides Waterhole, uh, west of uh, of uh, Shaftesbury. Burnt River was uh, was the first school was uh, established west of, of uh, Shaftesbury out uh, and the, the Methodist preacher and his wife was his wife was the teacher at Waterhole at that time yes I had to make application down to Edmonton of course to the government and uh, get the number of children in the district and so on uh, their location and so on and when you had so many children you could demand a school so on. And uh, I've forgotten the name of the teacher that was the first teacher at there. Uh, <laughs> she, she didn't get along with me. She was, <coughs> she was a Methodist with papers and I was a Methodist with papers. <laughs> and uh, they were getting up a Christmas tree concert and uh, <laughs> 
unless we, uh, us two were there, it wasn't a legal meeting. <laughs> well, uh, the, the, na the neighbors didn't have one, the wherewithal to make candy and stuff, and she demanded that they make, uh, make the candy for the Christmas tree. And I bought some sugar for this job and took it down there. Uh, but the neighbors had a meeting one time I was there, and they, they wanted to be able to buy their, their stuff at, at Hempstock's store instead of, of making the candy because they, they didn't have the wherewithal, no eggs or nothing uh, that uh, required to make candy, nuts and stuff. So I agreed to that, but <laughs> come a meeting, and <laughs> this teacher <coughs> demanded that we cancel all that because it wasn't a legal meeting. Our, uh, she and I weren't there. I walked out on her. That was a bad thing. I I, I wasn't a, I, I wasn't up to arguing and, and talking. But I, I quit. I walked out on it. That was too bad. Uh, too bad. I was ashamed of that ever since. I should have been able to talk and and and. Uh, and uh, Plead with the with the teacher that you know the situation. You mentioned a knife that somebody had made. Oh yeah, well, uh, Alec McAllister uh, wanted one of my butcher knives, uh, a proper butcher knife, and he he traded me a handmade, a, a blacksmith made butcher knife, uh, uh, hunting knife, and uh, I made a, a, a sheath for it. I have it at that turn of valley, at, yeah, turn of valley now. But uh, <laughs> by the way, Vernon had the, <laughs> that knife with him when he shot his first moose, you know. <laughs> he lost the knife among the <laughs> insides. Oh no. <laughs> Wandering around, <laughs> he lost it for quite a while, and in an awful time. <laughs> I have it yet, though. Anyway. <laughs> uh -huh. Now you talked about the lime. Oh, a, a lime out here. Mm -hmm. Yes, in 1916, uh, summer of 1916. I was always interested in any sign of mineral or something like natural resources. My folks back in Ontario had had uh, gone to Sudbury and had, was interested in my my uncle's brother sold, uh, sold claims it was where the copper mine and, and nickel mines are there at Sudbury. He, he that's his first first good money he ever had was in that. So I couldn't find any sign of anything like that out here, but uh, I was asking old Mr. old uh, Henry McCorrister about lime because we needed lime for chinking our houses instead of moss. The moss shrinked away and the wind would blow it, uh, through it and unless you used mud and the mud cracked too unless you, unless you knew enough to, to whitewash it again and so on. Uh, I wanted to make, anyway he told me that there was a, a uh, lime de uh, deposit and on a little creek and he told me where it was and I went down there I found it and uh, incidentally that is a very very interesting place it is a flats call it was called Mackenzie Flats at that time and uh, there was a fine big house in well a, a fine settlers house there and there was a big wing corral there. The, the corral, they had it for catching wild horses to brand them. There were some wild horses in the country at that time. And uh, they would, on horseback or on snowshoes, they would run these animals in, in, down till they would come to this big corral uh, wing fence. And the wing fence would head them down on just with a, one, a fence on one side, on, they gradually got down. There was a fence on both sides, and there was a big solid corral there where they used to, uh, the horses couldn't get out, and they would rope them and brand them. Uh, that, 
Now, it, it, just beyond that, there was this little spring. It came out from the, uh, from the ground like a, a little creek, something like the, the one at Brif Griffin Creek. Um, but it was loaded with lime, and as it came to the bank, uh, or, or the, the fall off it towards the, the river, it would uh, settle into the moss that would grow up in there, and it would the moss would turn like solid lime uh, and build little cups, little cups, little cups, all along until it was a big. Uh, you know, uh, what do you call that, uh, <laughs> a shape, uh, and uh, uh, with it was lime all uh, d down it, it at the bottom, below it, and uh, the lime would filter out into the moss and form solid there. Anyway, uh, I believe Mackenzie probably had burnt some lime there himself, but I didn't know that. There was a big hollow there. And anyway, I cleaned it out and made it made it into a a, a big kill, and I burnt. Uh, I piled in a hundred over over a hundred uh, bushels of uh, stone. I, I first of all built a a, a fireplace, a, a, a pile of, of wood in the shape of a fireplace, and then I built a stone over it until it was key, it was like a key arch. And then I put build it, build it full of of uh, rock above that, and then I put the fire below that and, and, and started the fire and burned it. And then this boy, that was Indian Indian boy, was well, along with me, quit me in the middle because I wouldn't go and visit this Indian folks. <laughs> the the girl there, incidentally, was a uh, she was just a Beaver Indian girl, but. She had been engaged to uh, Gibby Whitford, and uh, Gibby had introduced her to uh, to uh, some white white men there. Uh, what's her name? Hilker Hilkers, two brothers Hilkers. They were Hilkers were trying to start a ranch. And they got cattle and bought them down from Fort Vermilion through the road. Without a road, but through the bush, they brought down some cattle, and they weren't a poor, poor breed of cattle anyhow. But they, then they had hay way out in that in that north country, and uh, he was instead of hauling the hay, he had his cattle haul, uh, chased away out there, and they had a camp way out there, and he got this Gibby Whitford's girl to come and cook for him out there, and she she was out there. And Gibby found out about it, and he, uh, Henry McCorster told me the story about it. Apparently, he went to the to the Moss Lakes Reserve and was stayed overnight and was talking himself into a fit. And, and uh, he went away out to the camp and got there and, and uh, went for. Uh, uh, Hilker wasn't there, but he was in and uh, with this girl of his, stayed until Whitford came home at night, and, and then apparently they had a wrestling match. And whatever happened, uh, he probably had Whitford, uh, this is what, what uh, McCorister told me, Whitford probably had uh, this, his, his uh, opponent down, and the girl, Stabbed.